Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, my sister loves me, and so she said, is this NIH thing I've heard about going to hurt you? I said, no, not going to hurt me. It's going to kill me. There's a big difference. So let me explain to my sis what's going on. Because her response was, capping administrative costs at 15% seems perfectly reasonable, doesn't it? So let me explain to sis how it works. So in research, the way we are funded, there's a direct cost of research, which is, which is the actual experiment. And then there's indirect, which is the facilities and the administrative cost of doing the experiment. So I have, I will show you. So the direct cost of doing an experiment is the researcher, the test tube they're holding, maybe the research assistant, maybe a graduate student, the beaker, the sometimes small equipment like a microscope, and like if you have a mouse, a mouse, or if it's a patient, a patient. That's the direct cost of doing research. The indirect cost, which is not part of that direct cost, is the building they're in. So this research lab is in a giant building that's filled with a billion other labs. The cost of running the building, electricity and water. By the way, the cost of housing the mouse in that, it, it's got a little Hyatt hotel in there for mice. So that's one. And then also the big equipment, like all the equipment to run the experiment, all the IT, the, micro, the, uh, the, the bench, the chairs, even the IT guy who helps manage the, the uh, computers. Those are all indirect expenses. That's part of the facility cost. So the, as I said, indirect is facility plus uh, administrative. So the administrative costs are a number of people that are required to run the program. Uh, the president, the CFO, the head of research, uh, all the compliance people, but it's all capped. They're, none of them are like paying their salary or anything. It's, it's all capped at the maximum number that they can pay a level two executive uh, at the NIH. Not only that, only the percent that's actually doing research. So it's, and even then, it's all capped at 26%. And so institutions like ours, we're paying for the building, all the equipment, everything, and managing the compliance, paying payroll for the scientist and the assistant and all that kind of stuff. That's all part of the, in, of the indirect cost. In addition to that, we, we provide support for research through a number of different ways. When we negotiate with the NIH for that indirect rate, it's always negotiated less than the actual cost. So we're already paying the difference between what we're paid and what it actually costs us to do. We're also paying for salaries that are above the NIH cap. We're also paying for recruitment of, of scientists. And by the way, most people come, they don't have funding, so we have to give them two or three years of a startup package. Uh, and if they're short on funding for a year, we have to bridge them for funding. If we want them to, to, to start grants or something new, new projects, we, fu we fund that. So most institutions are paying 25 to 85 percent more than the actual direct cost of the research. So when they say we're going to cap it at 15 percent, that might cost an institution like ours 80, 90 million dollars. So that's really why it's a big deal. Enough of that. Let's move on to more great things uh, in our country. So, you know, we've had uh, problems with uh, loosening of requirements for kindergartners, uh, very much in the state of Texas. Uh, there's a lot of policies around that, so a lot of people aren't getting vaccinated. So what's the, what's the outcome? Well, we now have the largest measles outbreak in Texas in decades. So, uh, as I've mentioned before, we've gone through the R number. R number of 18 means that uh, for measles means that 95 or 96 percent of the population has to be vaccinated to prevent spread in outbreaks. So if one person gets it, doesn't spread. Unfortunately, uh, in the state of Texas, we've gone from 97 percent of kindergartens being vaccinated to 94 percent. That's that magic number. Below 95 and a half, 96 percent, you're going to have an outbreak. Well, we have had an outbreak, probably exposed from someone traveling, but now there are 58 measles cases. Um, 13 hospitalizations. Most of them are uh, unvaccinated. There are four people that claim to be vaccinated, but we don't know if they were vaccinated or if they had the two doses that are required. So it started in Gaines County, you know, mostly in a Mennonite community where the vaccination rates have been low. Uh, and so that's, that's the problem. So I've shown you this graph before. Measles used to be a huge problem. Everybody got measles, lots of morbidity. Some children died, a lot of encephalitis, loss of hearing other problems, but in, when the vaccine was initiated in 1963, a huge, a tremendous drop in, in cases. But they noticed that after one dose, you'd have these blips, occasionally we'd have 
uh, outbreaks, and so they realized they probably need two doses. So in 1989, they recommended two doses of the vaccine, and in 2000, measles was, was declared eliminated in the United States, <laughs> unless people get vaccinated. So after, you know, it's 2000, it always says, well, we don't need measles around. Why do you need a vaccine? So, you know, 25 years later, we have measles outbreaks because people stop getting vaccinated. All right. I don't, I don't get it. But anyway, uh, flu season, we're in the middle of the flu season, very high. Uh, you can see emergency department visits very high. Uh, the good news, of course, is that it's mostly uh, influenza A, that's in the yellow, very little influenza B. And the variety of influenza A is H3N2 in red and H, uh, H1N1 in orange here. The yellow means they just weren't subtyped, both of which are in this year's vaccine. So. Best way to protect yourself is to get vaccinated. You still might get the flu. That's their thing. You know, the vaccine develops an antibodies that circulate in your blood, so it prevents it, you from getting really sick. But it doesn't mean you can't get it in your mucosa. Uh, and so people do, uh, even if they're vaccinated, get influenza, but the severity is much reduced. COVID-19 remains pretty low. This is uh, emergency department visits for COVID-19. Hospitalization still pretty low. And mortality has been low, although I mentioned last time in January we had 2,000 deaths from COVID. Uh, but it's still low, uh, as lower than it was before. Why is that? Why is there a COVID around and yet the mortality is dropped? This, I think, is the reason. This is seroprevalence. So dark purple means that people have either antibodies because they were infected or got vaccinated. Most of the country has, is, has got antibodies against COVID. So unlike measles, this is actually pretty protective. And so you can see that that's probably why the mor mortality hasn't uh, been too bad. Plus the other thing is that um, the virus hasn't changed that much. So still XEC, uh, LP8 are the, the dominant strains. So that really hasn't changed. So the virus, has, virus hasn't changed much. We have a uh, broad immunity across the country and that's why it's not so bad this year. You know, when you have immunity to it, it works. When you don't, you get an infection. Uh, so some people have asked me about vaccination. So uh, as you know, I've talked about this before, the mRNA vaccines are really effective, but they aren't long lasting. So usually they, the effectiveness wanes after about six months. The recommendation by the CDC is two doses of any of the 24, 25 uh, vaccine, six months apart. And the question is, and I've gotten from people, well, if I had my vaccine, you know, like six months ago, should I get another one? Well, it's not necessarily recommended, but I would suggest that you probably do. So my feeling is if it's been six months since you've been either infected or had a vaccine, uh, it's probably a good idea to get a boost, booster. Anyway, so what's going on with bird flu? Continues to be fascinating to me. Uh, Wyoming had its first human case reported of H5N1. We're now up to 69 cases, 68 plus the Wyoming one makes 69, mostly in areas where there's you know, a lot of dairy cattle, because that's where it's been in Washington and California, Texas, uh, and the rest are in poultry workers. And one really interesting thing, a study looked at uh, veterinarians, and just, you know, people, veterinarians who've been around large animals, but not specifically around infected animals, and found in a group of uh, 150 large animal vets that three had antibodies to H5N1, which meant they were getting exposed to it even though they didn't know it. So that suggests to me that there's probably a lot more exposure than we really even know, but an interesting study. And then I mentioned this, there's another, this spillover of the recent, most recent form of H5N1 uh, last week, but there's been a second uh, spillover event in Arizona. So there is, uh, a, a dairy cattle uh, in Arizona that tested for this D1.1 genotype, which is what's currently circulating in the four major flyways. We talked about that last week. If you want to, if you want to, want to catch up on uh, the four flyways, you can look at last week's my video. Anyway, I want to end today with a bunch of shout-outs. First of all, congratulations to Dr. Catherine King, Professor of Pediatrics and Infectious Disease, who is the recipient of the 2025 Society for Pediatric Research Award in honor of, uh, of E. Mee Johnson, the most prestigious award by the Society. So congratulations uh, to Dr. King. Also, a big shout out to the Baylor Students Against Cancer Club that recently recruited individuals to sign up for the National uh, Marrow Donor Program. The students did a great job of educating the Baylor community about patients who could be helped by a bone marrow transplant, and thank you to the students who did that. 
And then finally, a big shout out to Dr. Helen Heslop, director of the Center for Cell and Gene Therapy, received the Pediatric Lifetime Achievement Award for her career uh, working in the field of cellular and gene therapy. Uh, she was awarded as president at their meeting uh, on transplant and cellular therapy. So congratulations to Dr. Heslop. So anyway, I want you to have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you and my sister, and I'm gonna test her on this whole thing on the NIH funding. I can't wait to see you next week.